Day breaks in Yellowstone National Park. Many visitors say that sunrise is one of the most special moments in the oldest national park in the USA. Founded back in 1872 as the world's first national park, today it is at the heart of the Yellowstone ecosystem. The area, alongside the Yellowstone River, is considered to be the only intact ecosystem in the Northern Hemisphere. In its center is the National Park, just under 9,000 square kilometers. The Yellowstone National Park is one of those locations in the world in which the flora and fauna has been forced to adapt to a habitat created by thermal activity. In 1978, it was recognized by UNESCO as a World Natural Heritage Site, a part of nature that must be saved for posterity. A place of contrasts in which the story of creation transpires at an accelerated pace. Early morning is the time span in which nature slowly awakes and streams and rivers steam in the early morning light. One senses the vastness of a breathtaking landscape shaped by the sheer overwhelming force of a subterranean dormant volcano, which is thoroughly unique in the world. Nowhere else is the story of Earth's creation so perceptible. Nowhere else is one so close to the glowing core of our planet, made of liquid stone, than here in Yellowstone National Park. Small springs grow into rivers in the plains of the park. The largest of them is the one that lent the park its name, the Yellowstone River. It's the longest free-flowing river in the USA and extends 1,080 kilometers from Yellowstone National Park to Missouri. At the beginning of its journey in Hayden Valley, the river is peaceful, paradise for anglers fishing for cutthroat trout. But the river's personality alters, as we will see later. The river will be our companion on our journey through the park, and we want to find out which secrets we can discover along the way. The fields and meadows bordering the banks of the peaceful section of the Yellowstone River are an ideal habitat for Canadian wild geese. The animals need territories that provide medium or large stretches of water, depths of at least a meter. A further prerequisite for the establishment of a breeding ground is an area immediately adjacent to the water on which the geese can pasture. Additionally, a widely undisturbed area on which to build their nests should also be available. Canadian wild geese are mainly found in the northern areas of the American continent, but initial colonies have also been established in Europe. In America, their migration between winter quarters and breeding grounds is seen as a sign of a change of seasons. Their return to the breeding grounds on the banks of the Yellowstone River is a sign of the approaching summer. On our journey along the course of the Yellowstone River, we arrive in Hayden Valley. Here we continually encounter hot springs. They characterize the image of the canyon through which the Yellowstone River flows first on its way through the National Park.
The smoke trails of the hot springs conjure up a mystical atmosphere, which especially in the morning hours presents a scene reminiscent of thousands of smoldering campfires. The Yellowstone River branches out continually. Small streams leave the course of the main river and irrigate the Douglas fir forests in the hinterland. The tracks of one of the original inhabitants of the National Park can be seen on the shores of these river arms. Gnawed trees and felled pines are an unmistakable sign of the fact that one of nature's biggest rodents lives here, the beaver. And then, suddenly, there he is, perfectly disguised in the backlight. He can hardly be distinguished from the dark color of the river. The animal moves smoothly through the water. One can just about sense a slight sound, as if someone had carefully dipped a paddle into the water. On average, the North American beaver grows to a total length of one meter, weighs somewhere between 17 and 32 kilograms, and lives for around 10 to 12 years. The beaver is 100% herbivore. He prefers herbs, shrubs, aquatic plants, and deciduous trees. He consumes the branches, branch bark, and leaves from the trees he fells. The beaver's lodge is in the middle of the water, an artistically arranged structure made of tree trunks and gnawed off branches up to a meter in height and crisscrossed with passages and retreats. Beavers don't hibernate, they just rest during the colder months, which is why they still have to ensure there is enough food even in winter. The beavers temporarily store twigs and branches directly in front of the entrance to the lodge. Should the surface of the pond freeze up, the beaver can simply access the stored branches beneath the ice and feed from the bark. We continue along the Yellowstone River. In the background, the Tetons form a natural border of the National Park for both man and animal. The Hayden Valley is a plateau. One can see Douglas fir forests and a green landscape, barely believing that on average, the height can be as much as 2,400 meters. One is only aware of the great height by taking in the view from one of the countless plateaus. The Yellowstone River meanders on through the National Park. Plains, it almost reaches the width of a mature watercourse, but in the valleys with a rocky base, it transforms into a raging mountain river. Not wide, perhaps, but with enormous flow velocity. The river has dug its bed out of the hard stone over the course of millions of years, and continues to do so, up to two centimeters per year. This is astonishing, as the basilite from which the Yellowstone National Park has its name, is a particularly hard stone, which can only be removed by high forces. Canyon was created by erosion, which today is known as the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. Here, geological formations can be seen, which enable us to take a peek back into the days of the region's creation. At the Yellowstone Falls, the river plunges 32 meters into the deep, from here, the Yellowstone River gathers speed, transforms into a raging river full of rapids, and offers hikers a breathtaking spectacle. This point is considered to be one of the hotspots for nature photographers, and for many, it is worth the journey to the Yellowstone National Park alone.
As the park was founded back in 1872, around 325 registered wolves lived in 42 separate packs. Even the most stringent safeguards could not prevent wolves from being eradicated in 1978. Research in the 1950s, however, demonstrated early on that the wolf played an important role in the balance of Yellowstone. Most scientists believed that the wolves would not significantly reduce the mule deer, fork goats, bighorn sheep, white-tailed deer or bison populations. They had a subordinated influence on grizzly bears and mountain lions. However, their presence would actually lead to a decrease of coyotes and a proliferation of red foxes. But it wasn't until 1995 that 31 Canadian grey wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone, placed under protection. Today, 325 of the animals live in 13 different wolf packs in the park. Since then, the bighorn sheep have to be on their guard again. They represent a tasty meal for the wolves. This she-wolf is hoping for an imprudent calf and creeps up, but calls it off when she sees that the young animal has reached the safety of its herd. That was a lucky break. For the first discoverers of the Yellowstone region, the canyon area was one of the most outstanding, which led to fantastic portrayals in the magazines of the period. As a participant in two Yellowstone expeditions, Thomas Moran painted several now famous pictures of the canyon. The publicity generated by these pictures was partly responsible for the creation of the National Park. The current canyon goes back to the end of the last glaciation, 14,000 years ago. Meltwater connected with the last glacier dug out of the V-shaped valley as we now know it. The erosion of the solidified volcanic rock caused by hot springs and volcanic activity continues to this day. The colors in the canyon are the result of the hydrothermal aging of ferrous components in the rhyolite. Due to the effects of the elements on the stone, a color change took place through oxidation. Colors indicate the presence or absence of water in the individual ferrous components. Most of the yellow in the canyon comes from iron and sulfur in the rocks. The Yellowstone River flows through the low falls into the canyon. The waterfall itself is probably the most spectacular of its kind in the entire national park. With a drop of 94 meters, it's the park's tallest waterfall and almost double the height of the Niagara Falls. Beneath the Yellowstone National Park is a huge magma bubble, which is also the cause of the natural phenomena that can be observed in Yellowstone. The area has the highest density of geysers and mud pools in the world, even surpassing Iceland. Snow and rain seep slowly through the layers of porous rock on the Yellowstone Plateau, which in addition is riddled with fractures and fissures. Some of this cold water comes into contact with hot, salty water, which is heated directly by the superficial body of magna. The water temperature rises above boiling point, but due to the high pressure and the weight of the overlying rock, the water remains in liquid form. The result is overheated water with temperatures above 200 degrees Celsius. This water is lower in density than the colder water and therefore lighter. As a consequence, the heavier water sinks. This creates convection currents 
that enables the light, receptive and overheated water to begin its slow journey toward the surface. In doing so, it follows the cracks, gaps and weaker areas of the rhyolite lava flow. During the hot water's journey through this rock, the high temperatures cause silicates to detach from the rhyolite and seal the system. A pipeline system is the result, one that can withstand the higher pressures. This is how a geyser is formed. All around us is a constant simmering, bubbling and boiling. There's hardly anywhere to be found where the water is not holding a combined concert and the colours of the different springs have us under their spell. One of the main attractions of the park is without doubt Grand Prismatic Spring. The basin of the thermal spring measures roughly 75 by 91 meters and is about 50 meters deep. On average, 2,000 liters of water at 70 degrees Celsius flow out of the ground. Single-celled microorganisms on the peripheral areas of the mineral-rich thermal springs cause the colors. These colors change into either more green or red, depending on the content of chlorophyll and carotenoids within the microorganisms. The water temperature determines the color. In summer, the biofilm made of these microorganisms tends to be more orange and red, while in winter, dark green is more likely to be the case. Due to the high temperature, the center of the spring is free of microorganisms. The high purity and the depth of the water lead to these intensive colors. Seen from the air, the Grand Prismatic Spring resembles an eye and is doubtless one of the most impressive images of the Yellowstone National Park. The largest mammal on the American continent lives there, the American bison. The males can weigh as much as a ton and the females 600 kilograms. Their sheer masses alone are enough to keep other animals at bay. But despite its enormous weight, a bison can manage top speeds of up to 50 kilometers per hour and is a good swimmer. The high buoyancy enables the animals to protrude out of the water while swimming. Its fur is a contributing factor. An adult has as many as 20,000 hairs per square centimeter. The greasy fur does not get wet, therefore provides buoyancy. 300 years ago, bison used to roam the entire American continent, distributed amongst the great plains of the country. They were the main source of food for the Indian tribes, but were only hunted for their personal needs. The natives of America wasted nothing of the animals they killed. Meat was used for food, the fur to make clothing and tents, and even the bones were used with which to make weapons. Through evolution, for a life in the plains, bison have adapted to the needs of survival in an unreal nature. They utilize water better than any cattle and are therefore perfectly suited for longer treks. But not every bison migrates. Lengthy migration 
is only essential in the drier regions of the prairie in order to exploit new pastures and water holes. To do this, outside of the mating season and in the days before the conquest of the American continent by the Europeans, the individual herds join together, making up large migratory herds. The herds could consist of thousands of animals whose dust plumes could be seen from miles away. The migrations led the herds over several hundreds of kilometers before they separated to return to their original small groups. Today, these migrations seldom occur. Apart from in Alberta, where twice a year a major bison migration of some 250 kilometers takes place. These migrations determine the rhythm of life in the days of the Indians. Whenever bison appeared in the territories of a tribe, there was food in great supply. But in the absence of herds, famine was commonplace and often war. We are now in the upper Giza basin of the National Park. This is the region of Yellowstone that features the highest concentration of geothermal objects in the park. It is located at the edge of the caldera, the collapsed basin-shaped crater floor of the dormant volcano, and covers roughly two and a half kilometers. Geothermal objects are geysers, mud pools, and craters from which ground heat or hot water is emitted. Around a quarter of all the geysers in the world can be found in the upper Giza basin of the Yellowstone National Park. This enormous number of geysers arose here because glacial deposits from the last ice age, so-called moraines, formed reservoirs beneath the basin in which water could be stored. The water flows through erosion channels, like for example the Firehole River, into the basin. Once there, it boils, whereby the steam causes excessive pressure and the accumulated water is explosively forced into the open. These hot springs and reservoirs also provide the best environment for hydrothermal communities. It may sound like rocket science, but it is in fact very simple. Single-celled organisms thrive in the hot water and have adapted optimally to the hot environment. They utilize the heat in order to transform food into energy. In doing so, bizarre shapes of different colors are formed Plants also make use of this environment in order to survive here. It is amazing just how differently the individual species manage to cope with these inhospitable conditions, tolerate heat and humidity, and use them to their advantage. From a geological point of view, the Upper Giza Basin is relatively young. It was created by the third major lava eruption of the Yellowstone volcano Caldera. This explosion caused the lava from inside the Earth to flow and formed, like stiff putty, the hills and indeed the landscape of the Upper Giza Basin.
This is how the most famous geezer in the Yellowstone National Park came into being. The Old Faithful. Time and again, visitors are always amazed to see the gigantic water jets, which the geezer regularly shoots into the air every 65 to 90 minutes. Its eruption behavior is independent of the other geysers in the area, as there is no direct connection between them. Old Faithful belongs to the nozzle-like geysers, which have a narrow water jet. The water flows from a reservoir consisting of two chambers, then shoots through a channel that has a diameter similar to that of a fireman's hose. The water column reaches heights of between 30 and 55 meters. An eruption can last anything between one and a half and two minutes, each time ejecting 14 to 32,000 liters of water. Back at Yellowstone River, we can see grazing wapiti. These species are known mostly in North America as elk. The term wapiti, when translated, means white rump and comes from the Shawnee Indians who lived in the Great Lakes area around 1500 and who presumably migrated south from there through the Yellowstone. A wapiti can have a shoulder height of 75 centimeters up to 1 meter 50 and weigh anywhere between 230 and 450 kilograms. The males are mostly twice as heavy as the females. The animal's antlers are ordinarily one to one and a half meters wide, measured from tip to tip. Wapiti are known for their loud, trumpet-like calls during the rutting season. This is the only time the bulls join the females and claim herds for themselves. Wapiti, one of the largest North American wild animal species, live in open forests, or at least close to one. In the summer, they climb up to the mountainous regions to great heights, but in the winter, they prefer more sheltered and low-lying areas. At one time, the native eastern Wapiti used to roam North America and was especially prevalent in the Rocky Mountains region. After being hunted till their extinction, Western Wapiti were brought here. Today, the Wapiti population in the USA is estimated to be around one million. That is roughly one-tenth of the number that once inhabited the forests 200 years ago.
In the 16th century, according to estimates, there were around 25 to 30 million bison in North America. At the end of the 19th century, there were less than a hundred animals left. They were victims of a systematic killing machinery instigated by European profiteers. Soon after the arrival of the conquerors, the mass extermination began, systematically and with military precision. In 1871, tanners in Germany and Great Britain developed a new method with which bison leather could be transformed into shoe soles and drive belts for machines. After the Franco-German War of 1870 to 1881, all European states equipped their armies anew, including boots for soldiers. Due to the associated profits, the bison hunters killed the animals in masses. All they wanted was the leather. The meat was left to rot in the prairie. The development of the country with railway lines played a further tragic role. During their construction, bison were killed in huge numbers as a food source for the railway workers. After the Central Pacific Railroad was opened, it became a people's sport to shoot the animals from the moving train. Thus, one single bison hunter could kill as many as 50 to 100 animals in one day. One of the most famous or rather notorious of these, was William F. Cody, who soon became Buffalo Bill. He is said to have killed 60 bison on one day with his rifle. From 1872 to 1874, more than a million bison, buffalo hides, were shipped eastwards. Due to the railway tracks, the bison were divided into a north and a south herd. The south herd was exterminated first. Then it was the North Herd's turn. Only the Northwest, with its defenders, the Lakota and Cheyenne, were initially able to keep even larger bison herds. In order to relieve the Plains Indians of their livelihoods and force them into reservations, the New Americans decimated these herds as well. They killed the remaining 10,000 animals by placing marksmen at waterholes. Thanks to the foundation of the Yellowstone National Park, the bison received a refuge in the nick of time. In 1894, there were just 800 of the animals in the whole of America, 200 of which were in Yellowstone as the last free-living bison in the United States. Their numbers fell as low as just 23 in 1902. Today, their stocks have risen to around 5,000 animals. The preservation of the bison from extinction is seen as one of the greatest achievements of American nature conservation.
We are now at Yellowstone Lake. The lake itself is a regulative for the Yellowstone River, as the river practically flows through it. Yellowstone Lake is 2,376 meters above sea level and by a length and breadth of 32 by 22 kilometers respectively, it is North America's largest mountain lake. Its average depth is some 43 meters with a maximum of 122 meters. In recent years, the bottom of the lake has risen significantly, on average roughly 2.5 centimeters annually. This indicates increasing geological activity. Geologists interpret this as a sign of an impending explosion of the Yellowstone volcano. As a result, sections of the park were closed for tourists. We leave Yellowstone Lake behind and continue our journey along the banks of the river. And then, at last, we see them. Black bears, initially just one hunting along the shore. Salmon trout are not just a delicacy in the eyes of the numerous anglers here, but also welcome prey for Mr. Bruin. He takes his time wading knee-deep through the water, but today he seems out of luck. Keeping our distance, we follow the animal and meet up with it again in the undergrowth. Somewhat disgruntled, the bear wanders around between the trees and sniffs distrustfully in our direction. Fortunately, he calms down, although he sometimes comes quite close to our camera. An American black bear's build is exactly as we perceive bears to look. The rump is huge, the extremities strong. Their paws have five strong claws, which the bears use to tear, dig, and climb. Like all bears, the tail is a short stump. Their large head is characterized by a long, hairless snout, small eyes, and round, erect ears. With a head to rump length of 1.5 to 1.8 meters, a shoulder height of up to 91 centimeters, and an average weight of around 100 kilograms, the black bear is significantly smaller and lighter than the grizzly. However, there is a marked difference in weight between the sexes, where females weigh somewhere between 40 and 230 kilograms, the males, with 50 to 400, are considerably heavier. Black bears live in a number of habitats, whereby they need sufficient food to eat and vegetation for privacy. They live predominantly in forests with very dense undergrowth, although they sometimes choose open terrain, such as grasslands and tundras, especially though where there are no grizzly bears. The American Bear Association estimates today's population in the United States alone at around 286 to 328,000 and 600,000 animals in the whole of North America. An estimated 500 to 650 of the bears live in Yellowstone.
The size of their territory depends, among other things, on the available food, sex, and their habitat. A female's territory is generally smaller. The territories in Washington state are between 200 and 500 hectares, while in other parts of the United States, they can be anything from 10, 20, 2,000, or even 4,000 hectares. In northern Canada, they can even be 100,000 hectares in size. These territories can also overlap, especially those of a male with several females. Yet still, the animals do not socialize, apart from in the mating season. In unspoiled areas, black bears often go on prolonged walks. Like all bears, American black bears live on their own. But in areas with a rich food supply, dozens of them can be seen together. We are now in one of the five basic regions of the Yellowstone National Park. Alongside the Giza Basin, Mammoth Hot Spring is probably the most spectacular region of the park, as here is a phenomenon similar to that of Pamukkale in Turkey, only bigger. The travertine terraces, which form reminiscent of the icing on a cake and create their own unique landscape architecture. Water flows down from the surrounding slopes, is warmed by volcanic activity, and swells to the surface at Mammoth Hot Springs. In doing so, sulfurous gases escape, causing a smell similar to rotten eggs. The travertine, or Sinter terraces, and the springs at Mammoth Hot Springs were officially discovered during a geological expedition in 1871, led by Ferdinand V. Hayden, in the same year, the gold prospector James C. McCartney gave the springs their name. But before Hayden came across them, it is presumed that some Indian tribes were aware of them. In Mammoth Hot Springs, water heated by the springs to 70 degrees Celsius glides over the terraces. It contains exceptionally high proportions of lime and minerals, which escape from the source and are deposited in the shape of terraces. The water flow stabilizes at roughly 1,900 liters per minute. Once at the bottom, the water drains off. Due to the constant new deposits, the flow direction changes and with it the temperature, and subsequently the color of the terraces from year to year, from white to blue, brown, green, yellow, orange or red. The terraces began to form millions of years ago. Today, the water deposits up to two tons of limestone daily. The arrangement of the terraces depends on the kind of deposits, as well as the growth speed of the minerals. The flow direction and water turbulence within the pools are also a determining factor. Algae and bacteria also settle in the flat pools. These bacteria are called thermophile. By the chemical building blocks of the hot springs, and the energy they draw from the environment, microbes develop delightfully colored communities. These have different colors depending on the temperature of the water. Larger life forms also live with these microscopic entities, which have adapted to life in such extreme conditions, such as mites, flies, spiders, and plants. They all form a habitat that still puzzles researchers to this day. However, one piece of the puzzle has been solved, and its discovery was revolutionary. Some of these microbes are similar to the first life forms capable of photosynthesis. They use the sunlight to transform water and carbon dioxide into oxygen, sugar, and other byproducts. These life forms 
so-called cyanobacteria, began to create an atmosphere that ultimately supported human life. Cyanobacteria have been found in some of the colorful mats and bands of the hot springs in Yellowstone. And thus, the circle closes, one that comes very close to the history of the creation of the Earth and mankind. One simply has to take the time to experience it. This is where our journey through the Yellowstone National Park, alongside the Yellowstone River, comes to an end. We were able to discover a fascinating world full of wonder and secrets, and now return to our point of departure. It's morning once more, and a mystical fog has spread over Yellowstone like a huge gossamer tablecloth. We experience the fascination of the area and the mysticism of the vastness in the world's oldest nature reserve, the World Natural Heritage Yellowstone National Park.